and then to couple with that, 2 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 10. My subject this morning, keep the fire burning. And if some of you get up the last two or three days and you have wood heat, you probably had to put on a fire. The fall has set in, and we need to take the coldness or the dampness off. But that's a natural fire. I'm speaking this morning about a spiritual fire that we need to keep burning. Let's stand for the scriptures this morning. Leviticus chapter 9, or 6, excuse me, verses 9 through 13. Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. Notice it mentioned there, burning all night long. And it burnt all day, too. That fire was to never go out. The priest shall put on his linen garment, and his linen breeches shall he put on his flesh, and take up the ashes which the fire hath consumed with the burnt offering on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. And he shall put off his garments and put on other garments and carry forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it, and it shall not be put out. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it, and he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Second Samuel chapter 8 and verse number 10. It's coming. Second Samuel 8 and verse number 10. And then Toya sent Joram his son unto King David to salute him and bless him because he had fought against Hadarezer and smitten him with Hadarezer had wars. Vessels brought to him, vessels of gold, silver, and vessels of brass. Ah, uh, must have been first Samuel. I got a wrong reference. I know that. <laughs> okay. Should be mentioning fire. Lord Jesus, this morning we want your presence to be here this morning in a very special way. Let your anointing be upon us as we deliver the message that you have put upon our hearts. We give you honor and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The fire is to ever be burning. Notice there in the scripture that we read to you first, the fire is to be burning all night. And then later in it mentioned it's to, he's to put a fresh fire on in the morning. That would mean it would burn all day. Some examples in the scripture where the fire was burning, we had a few of those this morning. And then a question this morning, who is supposed to keep the fire burning? And then after we find out whose responsibility is, then how do we keep the fire burning? A few points under there. And then why must we keep the fire burning? So a few questions there that we want to answer in our lesson this morning. Now... Follow the air. How many's got wood heat still? One, oh, four, five, or six. God bless you. I'm glad those days for me are done. Uh, has anyone that has wood burn ever experienced trying to get a fire on with green wood or with wet wood? Yeah. Anyone that has fired all has had one of those experiences, if not both. Now, ever had a hard time to keep it going? <laughs> When you thought it was going, it went out. So what did you do? You put more cardboard in and birch bark if you had it and some gas if you had it. And you started again and you'd get down by the draft and start blowing with all your might. And you were trying to get a fire going with wet or damp or green wood. Something that our grandchildren will not know anything about. Say, why our grandchildren? Is anyone... Been reading the papers lately with all the carbon tax and everything, and wood's on its way out. Hate to inform you of that, but <laughs> there's lots of programs to try to get rid of wood and bring on the solar and, and the heat pumps and all that. Okay, so uh, 
Let's talk about something a little more interesting maybe than the economy. It's back to school Sunday. Well, maybe that's not encouraging either. It's depressing for some, depending on whether you're a parent or a kid. <laughs> and this past week, I seen a number of parents put on Facebook pictures of their children going off to school and whatever grade they're going in and then go back to the first grade and put both pictures on and seeing the difference and then they'd ask well where has the time gone and they're growing up all too fast and that's the truth we want to do everything that we can to make sure that our children have an experience with God when they leave our front door and head to the school system say so why there are things that will assail them in this day and age that we didn't have to contend with philosophies uh, beggarly elements of this world. There's peer pressure. Now, we had peer pressure, but our peer pressure was you going to the ball game tonight. And that wasn't in town. That was at the local school. You know, it wasn't competitive. Today, they've got the media that's against them for all their morals, promoting bad things. And then you have teachers today in alternate lifestyles that was not known in our day, or if it was, they were in the closet. And there's dope and drugs and all these things. It's a terrible time for a young person to be in the school system, and yet we need an education to continue on with our lives. I tell you what, we want to do everything that we can to make sure that our children in Christianity are uh, victorious and overcomers, even in the school system. And I really encourage and compliment and and hand it to our children who have made up their mind, I'm going to serve God even while I'm in school. They, they need uh, hands up, don't they? The best way that you, cannot, you and I as adults or as parents that can uh, assure that they will maintain a Christian life while they're at school is make sure they're in a house of God and have an experience with God at a very early age. And I'm thankful for that. I, I can boast of that if you can use that word. I had an experience with the Lord as a young child. And I, I want to tell you, it has kept me down through the years. And I went to school with some others that went to the same church as I did, but they didn't have the experience with the Lord that I had. And I would see them do things they shouldn't do, and then we'd still sit together in church Sunday morning. <laughs> I'd see them say things they shouldn't say, and we'd sit in Sunday school the, the next Sunday morning, Anyone know what I'm talking about? You know, not everyone that's sitting in church is the Christian they ought to be. But we want to encourage our young to get an experience with God when you're young. Something that will keep you down through the years and you don't have to go with every wind that's blowing. But something that is solid. I'd like to refer to that as a burning bush experience like Moses had. Uh, to know for sure that God is real and beyond the shadow of doubt. And if a child can get that at a young age and keep the fire burning, then they've got a good foundation for the rest of their life. Now, having said all that, in 2019, there seems to be a lack of fire in Pentecostal circles. We've got to keep the fire burning, folks, in the church and in our personal lives. Fire in the scripture is what represents the presence of God. And I get ahead of myself here to tell us it's all of our responsibility to keep it burning. Now, some may feel it's other people's responsibility. We keep the fire burning through a good prayer life, reading the word of God, and by serving in God's kingdom. So keep the fire burning. Let's look at some examples in the scripture here. And one that's most well known to us is that of Elijah where he was challenging the prophets of Baal, the God that answers by fire, <laughs> let him be God. Elijah knew his God, knew his God well, so he gave the others the first chance. You go ahead. So the prophets of Baal begin to call upon their God and uh, to try to bring fire to the sacrifice, and nothing happened. And the Bible mentions they cried from morning until noon, and Nothing happened. They begin to dance and cut themselves and go through all kinds of uh, seances or whatever, and nothing happened. 
midday had passed and it was going on towards the evening and there was no response, no one answered, and no one paid attention. That's verse 29 in the chapter of the Bible that records that. Now you might think that Elijah standing on the, the sidelines would be a good sport and encourage them on just a little bit. It was actually opposite of that. He taunted them some. Oh, he said, uh, you need to shout a little louder. Surely your God is on vacation. Perhaps he's busy and uh, needs to be awakened. Elijah knew that Baal was not going to answer because Elijah himself knew there was only one and only one God and that one that would answer by fire. He knew him in an intimate way. He knew what it was to pray he knew what it was to hear from God. He knew what it was to serve the Lord. And he knew when he prayed the fire was going to fall. So he taunted them a little bit. Finally, it's Elijah's turn. And he knew what it was to pray. And so to make things a little more impressive, it's his turn. He got the sacrifice all in order and the, the wood laid upon it and all this and that. And he said, now... I want uh, the servants to go and bring four barrels of water and pour it on the sacrifice. And those who know anything from a natural fire, for anything that opposes fire, it's water. Anybody on the fire department besides Ernie and I? That's what we fight fires with is water. And uh, they come out with something that I didn't know anything about until I joined the department. They come out with what they call wet water. That's profound but you can make water wetter. <laughs> There's a chemical you put in it, <laughs> and that when it uh, hits and, and yeah, all the steam in that, but it makes it last longer. It's a foam of some sort. Wet water. Isn't that profound? <laughs> okay. So he says, bring all the water. Oh, bring all the opposition that you can find and pour it on the sacrifice. And then he says, do it a second time. And they brought another four barrels and did it the second time. They said, to make good, do it the third time. And the third time they brought another four barrels and just soaked that sacrifice and the wood and everything else. Now, I want to tell you something. This was at a time of drought. Twelve barrels of water in time of drought. The prophet Zabel thought he was really off of his rocker. He's a nutcase. <laughs> right? But Elijah knew he's God. And after having uh, laid everything in order and put all of this water on it, he begins to prepare himself to pray. And we told you earlier, he didn't know what it was to pray. He didn't know what it was to hear from God, and he served the Lord. This time, his particular prayer was very short. It was only 63 words, but it said an awful lot. He starts out with an introduction, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. It's much like anybody ever hear a prayer start like this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <laughs> He's acknowledging the one and only true God. And then he gets to the petition part. He said uh, three things here. First of all, he said, let it be known that you are God in Israel. And also, let it be known that I'm just your servant. And number three, that I've done this at your command. In other words, this isn't my idea. Just three little petitions there in this 63-word prayer. Then he moves to the next part and says, Answer me, O Lord, so that the people will know. Number one, you're the Lord. Number two, you do answer by fire. And number three, that you're turning their hearts back to uh, the Lord again. And after that 63-word prayer was ended, having proved those six or eight things there, the fire of the Lord fell, burned up the sacrifice, burned up the wood, burned the stones and the soil, and licked up all the water in the trench. And the people said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. It was the God that answered by fire. Let's keep the fire burning. Do you know the Lord like Elijah knew him? Do you know what it is to pray and seek his face? Do you know what it is to hear from him? Do you know what it is to serve him and do as he says in his word? Another example in the scripture, there were two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And this was after Jesus had been crucified. 
buried. He had mentioned that he would raise again the third day. But there was two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They were talking about the things that were happening at Passover. And Jesus joins the conversation. And uh, he asked them what they were talking about. And, and they told him and wanted to know what's new. And their first question to him was, if you don't know what's going around here, probably what's new is you are new. And yeah, that was exactly so. <laughs> he was the risen Lord. He had joined them on that road. Come time to eat, and they constrained him and asked him to eat some supper with them. And at the supper, as he blessed it and parted it, oh, something different really happened. And they knew again this was something extraordinary. And here's their testimony. Wow. Didn't our hearts burn within us? <laughs> Well, he talked with us, by the way. I'm talking about the fire of God's presence. Amen, almighty God, among the people. Moses himself, the burning bush experience, where he was told to put off his shoes, the feet or the ground whereon he stood was holy ground. And I'm thankful for burning bush experiences. The children of Israel themselves, God led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire. By night, it was God's visible presence with them 24-7. Now, Elijah, from the first example we met, and it didn't defeat the prophets of Baal, of Baal, it was God who defeated them. Elijah was only the servant. Correct? But the servant had the fire of God. Now, there's others in the scripture that experienced the fire of God like... Uh, the prophet Jeremiah, if you've ever read his account in the scripture, it was Jeremiah that said, uh, it was in my bosom or in my bones like a fire. He said, and I could not stay. In other words, I had to let out or I had to preach what the Lord was telling me. It's like a fire shut up within my bones. John the Baptist said that Jesus would come and he would baptize them with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Amen, an experience that comes from God. Then at Pentecost, we see where the Holy Spirit was coming down in tongues like as of fire. Fire representing the very presence of God. And then if you look over into the book of Revelation, John had a vision of the risen Lord, and he spoke with eyes that were fiery eyes. And those eyes could see right through the soul and discern everything that was in so fire, the very presence of God, the fire and revelation, the judgment of God, his presence judging the people. What about the fire among us this morning, God's presence? When we give our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ and he places his spirit on the inside of you, as John the Baptist had prayed, it's the Holy Ghost and Fire, the fire, the very presence of God, the thing that will burn out the things that shouldn't be and make you a shining light to glow in this world. Sadly, today, among many Christians, the fire is dying out. Maybe only a flickering flame that once was a real fire. Now, what's happened over the years? Well, we need to consider a few things here this morning. And first is the question, well, whose responsibility is it anyway to keep the fire burning? Now let's think about that. And uh, if it was a physical fire, uh, I'm thankful for the heat pump that we have here in the church and if not the electric. First couple of pastorates that I was at, Cushabaquack and Coldstream, it was nothing but wood. And I know whose responsibility it was to keep the fire going. It was the preacher. And a matter of fact, if the preacher was away and he didn't assign somebody to do it, they went to church and it was cold. You say, why? Because no one else took the responsibility. And it's that way in a spiritual sense, too. Some people feel it is the pastor's responsibility to keep the fire burning. Well, for sure, it's his responsibility to keep his own personal fire burning. <laughs> and surely there is some responsibility on his behalf to keep the fire in the church burning. If you look into Leviticus that we read to you as a text this morning, it was clearly the priest's responsibility in verse 12 to keep the fire burning 
on the burnt sacrifice. And so maybe people get the idea from that. It's the priest or the preacher that keeps the fire going or the church staff or maybe the deacons are responsibility or responsible to keep it going, the Sunday school teachers. It's everybody else's responsibility to keep it going except mine. Now, you wouldn't say that, but you think that. <laughs> oh, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, brother, if you bring that up on the screen, that was Old Testament, okay? The priest, Old Testament sacrifices, tabernacle, etc. Let's move over to the New Testament. Whose responsibility is it to keep the fire burning? 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. I must have forgot to send the scriptures over to Tim. But ye, who's ye? <laughs> who's ye? It's Y-E, not Y-E-A. <laughs> I want to put Y-E-A, ye. <laughs> right? Ye, we, ye. Ye are a chosen generation. That's talking about the people. All right? That's you. That's New Testament. Ye our chosen generation, a uh, royal, whoo, I thought it was the priest's job to get the fire. It is. <laughs> now, ye are that people. You are the royal priesthood. And holy nation, a peculiar people. And the word peculiar there doesn't mean strange. It means belonging exclusively to one. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ, Correct. You're a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye, everybody say ye, ye, ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Can I tell you this morning, you as well as I are responsible to keep the fire burning. We are all priests in the New Testament. It's everybody's responsibility to keep the fire burning. We are all priests. The Old Testament, it was the priest's responsibility to carry God to men and men to God. In the New Testament, it's every one of our responsibilities to take God to our neighbor, to someone on the job, to someone that we know, to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ and have them experience the same fire that's in Christ Jesus that you and I know or are supposed to have. Amen. It's all of our responsibility. So, ask the question, whose responsibility to carry the fire or to keep it burning? Yes, it's my responsibility, but it's also your responsibility to keep the fire burning in your own life and in the church. How does the fire keep burning in the church? The church is only as strong as the people in it. You make up the church. If you're on fire, the church is on fire. If you're not, the church isn't. It's all our responsibility to keep the fire burning. Amen. The fire is burning. Folks ought to be friendly and show the love of God that was to be shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Now I say be friendly and show the love of God. I've got a little illustration here. Anybody... Uh, Shop Walmart, by the way. And now some may protest. I know there's a big protest out there. There's some people that just don't believe in shopping anything to do with Irving. Well, I don't think Irving owns Walmart. They might next year, but not yet anyway. <laughs> okay? But any anyway, Walmart. Uh, you walk through the door, there's someone there. Welcome to Walmart. And you go through that guy and you get into one of the departments, some of the departments then, can I help you find anything? And uh, you're looking, well, no, I, I'm just, just shopping, came here and I'll let you know if I need anything. And finally you get your items together and you go up to the checkout and you're, you're there and did you find everything that you need? And it's shopping in and thank you for shopping at Walmart. And then you go out and the same guy greets you that come in <laughs> Uh, come back soon. Have a nice day, ma'am or sir. Four or five times somebody's showing them friendly at 
Walmart. Now, they have a motive for doing that. They're hired, okay, and they're schooled, they're trained. <laughs> we want this place to be uh, open for business and people to come here so when they come through our doors, you need to be friendly to them. So they're friendly at the door. They're friendly in the back in the front. They're friendly at the checkout. They're friendly at the door again. And, and uh, that guy that greeted you on the way out the door said, to come back again soon. You probably said, I will. <laughs> now, let's leave Walmart for just a minute and let's come to the Nashua Valley Pentecostal Church. I wonder if there was a guest this morning that come to the parking lot if someone else drove up and say, Welcome to National Oak Valley Pentecostal Church. Or if you both came to the door without speaking to one another. I'm on the inside of the door. I hope there was somebody there this morning that said, uh, Welcome to National Oak Valley Pentecostal Church. Right? Hopefully, during the service, you didn't have to sit alone and someone made you welcome at National Oak Valley Pentecostal Church. And when you go out the door this morning, I hope the pastor or assistant pastor or somebody's on location to give you a piece of candy to keep you sweet and say, it was nice to have you here today. And after you go home, if you happen to be a guest, you're likely to get a call saying, we, it was nice to have you. And that's what Valley Pentecostal Church best said, we'd like to have you come again. Why is all that necessary? Because we want people to feel welcome in the presence of the Lord. And to feel the fire of the Holy Ghost. Amen. When they are here. I'll tell you, I don't want us to be in competition with Walmart. They're selling goods. We represent the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is a better product or commodity than anything Walmart's got. Hallelujah. So they're there to make money. We're here to get souls ready for the kingdom. We need to experience the fire of the Holy Ghost, all ages, young children. And it wasn't too long ago when Jenna was here with her brand new baby. I think that is so nice. So, so, oh, she's too young to be in church. No, they're not. Amen. When they learn and when they cry in church, I like the sound of that, by the way. It, it might be uh, disturbing to some. But hey, there's a child getting used to the atmosphere of the presence of the Lord. Right? And right from a child on up through, they should be able to feel the presence of God before they go down to the Sunday school class, while they're in the Sunday school class, when they come up from the Sunday school class, at the altar, anywhere to feel the presence of God. We need to keep the fire burning in our souls and burning in our church. Amen. People of all ages. We need all ages. So now, knowing that we need to keep the fire burning, the question is, how? How do we keep the fire burning? I'm glad you asked that. Three things here. Number one, communication is the key. Now, we get communication with God. That's prayer, okay? Communication is the key. In any marriage, you need communication, or you begin to lose touch with one another. You need to communicate to know what the expectations of each other are. Well, when it comes to the things of God, we need to communicate with God. And how do we communicate with God? It's called prayer. Prayer is the key. I also know that when it comes to prayer, <laughs> we're a little bit ignorant. You say, why? <clears throat> ignorant meaning not knowledgeable or ignorant meaning rude. Both cases. Okay, both cases, when we go to pray, because we do all the talking, and we don't give God a chance to say anything. Communication ought to be two-way. You talk to God, but he also talks to you, so that brings me to the next point. Communication being prayer, you talking to God, but in God talking to you, let's go to his word then. That's the second point. How do we keep the fire burning? By prayer and by reading the word of God. It's the word of God that speaks to us. Especially if we prayed before we read. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds, open our understanding to what you're saying. What will you have me to do? So prayer and reading the word of God followed up by active service. Lord, what can I do for you today? I want to be obedient. How can I be effective in your kingdom? So yes, read the word of God, pray, 
seek his face, and be active in his kingdoms. That's the way to keep the fire burning in your own life as well as in the church. So we keep the fire burning, or that's how we do it. And that brings me to the last portion of the scripture, the three things here. Well, why do we need to keep the, the fire burning? Another three we- reasons. Number one, God knows what's best for us. Uh, when it says something in the word, for example, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. When you read that, how many said, why? Thou shalt not kill. Why? <laughs> thou shalt not covet. Why? <laughs> you know something? My earthly father took an example from God. You need to take out the garbage. Why? Because I said so. End of question. Hallelujah. All right. And so why do we keep in the, the fire burning? Because God said so. End of. You don't need to ask why. Just do it. Hallelujah. All right, because God said so. And he knows what's best for us. And so if he says to keep the fire burnt, just better do it. We don't have to ask why. Just do it. Well, that's not satisfactory for some people. I think I'm living in a generation of people that as long as your feet was under your dad's table, you did as he said and his house rules were followed. Yeah. Yeah. We'll bring back the good happy days and the the belt and the stick. (laughs) Apply the Board of Education to the seat of knowledge. Come on. It was just because I said so. (laughs) You know, we're under Father's Day. It's the same in the word. And and I'm not trying to paint our God as a, a great big monster or a brute beast. He's a loving God. But he does have some rules to follow. In his house, in his kingdom, in his word. And so if he tells us to keep the fire burning, he expects us to. And just forget about why. Just do it. We're living by Father's rules. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But there's another reason why we should keep the fire burning. And you say, why? It's because my neighbor's in darkness and he needs to see the light. Yeah, didn't you read in the scripture in Matthew? And this is one of the things that keeps the fire burning. We're to read the word of God. Did you ever read in there where we're supposed to be a light that's set on a hill? And don't hide that light under a bushel, right? Because a light that's on a hill can be seen for many miles. Ye are the light of the world. Amen. We don't want to walk in darkness. We're the light of the world. And so the world needs to see our light shining and also look to us as an example to live godly in Christ Jesus. They may need someone to pray. They may need someone to help. And they're looking for those who have an experience with God and have the fire to be able to offer them something. So, yeah. We keep the fire burning because God said so and knows what's best. We keep the fire burning because we have neighbors that may not know God and they need to see our light and our good works and also come to the experience that we have in Christ Jesus and experience fire for themselves. I'm wondering today if that fire might be dangerously low in some of our lives and just a flicker of light instead of a bright, shining light. There's another reason that we should keep the fire burning, and I've got this as number three. It probably should have been number one. And that's for those who are following in our footsteps. Future generations, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, those who follow after, they need to know that mom and dad know God for themselves. They need to know that grandma and grandpa 
have an experience with the Lord and they live right and they're going to do right regardless of what happens in the government, the economy or whatever else. And so when I'm at school, that's an encouragement to me because my parents and my grandparents and great grandparents know what it is to do. And I want to do right. Amen. They're following in our footsteps. Amen. So we need to keep the fire burning for future generations who will walk in our footsteps. And keep the fire burning for those who will come behind. After all, our hopes and our dreams have come and gone, and our children sift through all that we've left behind. May the clues that they discover and the memories that they uncover might light and lead them to the road that each must find. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light the way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lives that we inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. We need to drop to our knees and say, Lord, flame up the fire in me. Make me the man and woman of God that I need to be. Why? Because there's somebody following in my footsteps. Why do I need to keep the fire burning? Because God said so. Because our neighbors need the Lord. And because there's future generations that's going to walk in our footsteps. May our footsteps lead them to the Lord and not elsewhere. Can we stand this morning? Keep the fire burning. Elijah knew his God beyond the shadow of a doubt. He knew what was to pray. He knew what was to hear from God. He knew what was to serve the Lord. So when it came to challenge the prophets of Baal, he was very confident that his God and his alone would answer by fire. The two disciples on the Maus Road knew what it was to feel the fire of God burning in their bosom. Children of Israel knew what it was to have the fire of God, the visible presence 24-7. Jeremiah knew what the fire of God was. It was a fire shot up in his bones. John the Baptist, Pentecost, Revelation. Who is supposed to keep the fire burning? Oh yeah, the priest is. Make sure that that fire on the burnt offering doesn't go out day or night but come over into the new testament when we're all new testament priests a royal priesthood a royal nation to show forth the praise of him that calls from darkness and whose marvelous light we're all responsible to keep the fire burning well how we need to pray we need to read his word we need to be in service in the kingdom these are three ways that we can keep the fire burning well why because God said so. Because there's others that are walking in darkness and need our light. And for future generations that are following in our steps. Church, individuals in the church, keep the fire burning. Hallelujah. Lord, this morning, thank you for your presence today.